So you are in for a treat. Dirk Rosen is a ocean engineer from UC Santa Barbara and the founder of Marine Applied Research and Exploration, a nonprofit organization dedicated to filling the knowledge gap of the deep sea below scuba depths. Dirk has 30 plus years of deep sea equipment design, build, and operations experience with ROVs, that's remotely operated vehicles, uh, manned submersibles, and tow sleds. He's led or co-led 37 ocean expeditions, assessing marine protected areas, characterizing national marine sanctuaries, performing, performing fish stock assessments, evaluating impacts of wave power, recovering lost equipment at sea, and removing derelict fishing gear. Dirk and Mayer have performed a census of California's network of MPAs from Mexico to the Oregon border since 2003. And previously, Dirk was president of Deep Ocean Engineering, test pilot for three Deep Rover 1,000 meter rated manned submersibles, and a co-designer of hundreds of ROVs. Later at Hawks Ocean Technologies, he managed the build of Challenger, an 11,000 meter rated manned submersible designed to explore the Marianas Trench, which of course is where Mr. Cameron dove to. He also worked with NASA for five years, impl helping implement robotic standards now used on the International Space Station. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dirk Rosen. So who wants to do that cardboard canoe pod? <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Uh, so we've just come off a two-week uh, expedition. I'm going to show you a little bit of footage at the very end. That's the teaser. There are going to be some graphs in here, but they're, they're, don't, don't fret. You'll, you'll be able to follow them. And then what I want to tell you about is the gem that's in your backyard, which is the Santa Barbara Channel Islands and really the epicenter of, a, of an incredibly bold conservation initiative that started right here in Santa Barbara. So my goal at the end of the, at the, end of the evening is that you become an ocean advocate and, um, and, and talk to the people in your neighborhood, your friends, just about how important the ocean is to all of us. And so uh, I'm gonna take you with me now. So first of all, we, I, I'd like you to, to, to leave um, terra firma, and we're gonna talk about a few ocean facts. So first of all, it's gonna be hard for me to see, but raise of hands, who is either set foot on, snorkeled, or scuba dove out at the Channel Islands? So it looks like, I guess, half of you. That's fantastic. Okay, the other half, you, you need to go. <laughs> In your last 10 breaths, how many of them came from the ocean? And I wanna hear a number. I heard a seven. How many, how many of the last 10 breaths did the oxygen come from the ocean? Oh, I heard a five. Simple math, five out of 10 is half, right? Half of, half of our oxygen comes from the ocean. We should be pretty thankful. I wanted to be able to suck out half the oxygen in the room and then be able to turn it back on so that you could experience what it would be like without a healthy ocean but I, I haven't been able to perfect that yet. Okay, what percentage of the CO2, mostly from burning uh, fossil fuels, is absorbed into the ocean? I heard a 35, that's good enough, I think, for me. Uh, it's, it's roughly a third, thank you very much. So that contributes to ocean acidity, and I'm not gonna talk about that tonight. Now, um, this is a challenging question, but for you, what, is, what do you think the ocean's biggest challenge is? I'd like, this will help me kind of um, navigate. Plastics? Trash? Um, apathy humans? De dead zones? Warming? Global warming? Not global warming, in-depth warming. Oh, yeah, in-depth. Thank you. So, that, that helps me for tonight, to, to try to address the things, the, the few things that I, kn I know about. Um, for me, personally, I think the biggest problem the ocean has is it looks just fine. And that's because we, most of us are looking at the surface. And um, our business at Mare is going, is going under. You know, we like to say our business is going under. So we, <laughs> we are going down and looking um, every year 
to see how the ocean is changing over time. And I've, in my short time, lifetime, have seen a lot of change. And the whole, the whole reason uh, some friends and I started Mare was because uh, as a kid, I had my dad's friends would take me out fishing at the Farallon Islands up off of San Francisco. And uh, we were catching big fish. We could keep uh, a couple of salmon. Didn't matter if they were king salmon or silver salmon. And, and by the time I was 25, that had all changed. The fish were smaller, some you couldn't keep. And then by the time I was 40, I was really concerned about this. And I'm 40, 41 now. <laughs> so I th my hope is, is that you can help us spread the word. The, the, we just don't think about the ocean a lot. And so I think that the ignorance is contributing to us not paying attention to, to some of the plights. And I'll, t I'll talk about some of the successes too. It's not gonna be doom and gloom. But the amazing thing to me is less than 5% has been explored. So we know much more about Jupiter, the moon, all these other places. We know it fairly well in most places down to scuba depth of say 60, 100 feet. But the big missing data gap is below that, which is where most of the animals live. So typical problems, you guys talked about them, pollution, uh, some types of fishing, some are perfectly fine. Uh, runoff, you know, our rivers empty into the ocean, that contributes to uh, dead zones, and it's often over fertilization of fields that, you know, runs into the rivers and then causes um, eutrophication. I'm not gonna go into that. And then the, the, one, the one that's up and coming is deep sea mining. So most people in here have a smartphone. We're running out of some of those materials on land. We're not doing a good job recycling them. The people talk about mining asteroids or going to other planets. I worked at NASA, that ain't gonna happen. Um, so it's gonna be the deep sea and no one is gonna see. It's gonna be beneath the surface. So these are things to pay attention to and think about. And then climate change, that's the big one. And that's what we're starting to see uh, already since we started this work here in the Channel Islands in 2003. Um, we talked about Brian tonight. In the good old days, Brian, this was a California record, right? Halibut. Cut, speared right here in the Channel Islands. I have not seen a halibut that big. So this is the fecundity that we had, and if we forget that it was there, we won't we'll have a new normal. It's important we remember Brian's halibut. This is how a healthy ocean looks and the size of the, of the fish there. And so here's the real reason. Okay, first graph, it's, it's getting worse, right? So it starts out, most of the fish populations are healthy. These are rock fish. This is the white fish on your plate. It's called snapper. It's called all sorts of things. Very um, delicious and sought after. And the sizes are going down, but also the numbers are going down. We've over-harvested. And then the state of California, your state, if you're from California, decided to do something drastic. And in 1999, we created this bold mandate to set aside some ocean to recover, like a park. And then the first implementation of that was not by the government, it was by the citizens of Santa Barbara that didn't want to wait for California to get its act together. 2003, your first network of, of marine reserves went into place, in, and they were enforced in the Santa Barbara Channel Islands. And that's when we started Mare, because no one knew what was going, down, going on down deep. So we, with my background and um, my colleagues here in the audience tonight, we have these robotic submarines that we can deploy and we can get the data where most of the animals are living and we can figure out, are these reserves helping the animals? So keep that question in mind because we're gonna answer it a little later. Um, I don't have the graph as it's continued, but some of these fish have gotten off the overfish list. Some are still way low and um, unfortunately may go extinct. So where, do, where does Mare work? There's organizations like Woods Hole and Scripps and Ambari that can go really, really deep. So they're the submarine on the far left. That's not us. We work on the continental shelf between um, 3,000 feet deep and scuba depth of, say, 100 feet deep. But this is where the action is. This is where the runoff is, the impact, 
and the potential recovery. It's also where the food is. This is where the biomass that, that ends up on our, on our dinner plates. And we're at this incredible crossroads right now of, of knowing how to do things, understanding there's problems. All of you thought of an ocean problem. We can start to address these now, and, and we, need to, we need to do it in a bigger way along with the rest of the world. And so that's, and this is just what we do, is uh, we go down and look, basically. And because we can only manage what we know, and if you, if you are harvesting fish and you don't know how many are there or their life cycle, where, you know, how they reproduce, do they have a spawning aggregation where they're very vulnerable to being fished? What time of year is that? We just did a project down here in Santa Barbara about your sea cucumber industry. They were being fished during their spawning season, which was great for the, um, e makes them easy to catch, but it was <laughs> wiping out the population. So that, those laws are being changed now so that the sea cucumber can be a sustainable fishery and um, for future generations. And uh, do we have anybody here under, under 12? Yes, okay, so you're gonna inherit this planet. And uh, so we're gonna do the best we can before you know, you've know you gone through school and then you take over for me and you're up here talking about what it was like when you were a young boy. So we gather this information, we provide it to the people with the power to make change, and then we, um, we hope that they do the right thing, but at least they're armed with knowledge. And we make that, those, those results available to the public as well. And so this is really what our vision is, or our goal, is, is intelligent ocean management. And, and what I love about this museum is that it's got commercial applications and exhibits and it, you know, we have oil and gas, we have DSI, you know, the diving helmets, we have shipwrecks, we have lighthouses. There's no reason that environmentalism, sustainable uh, fisheries, and commercial uses of the ocean can't coexist. There's no reason they can't. It's just we have to work together better. And um, there's plenty of ways to do that. So here's what's going on in the United, uh, in the world. Uh, about 10 years ago, less than 1% of the world's ocean was protected. So that meant we could fish 99%. If you look at uh, the terrestrial world where we live, we have 16% of our land is in a park, a protected zone. And yet we freely fish the whole ocean. So already we're up a little bit over 3% now. So this is a stunning improvement. And what did California do? California set a new bar. So we have 16% of our state waters, which go out three miles, are in a reserve. That means you either can't touch any, you can't fish any fish or animal there, or it's very limited to the type of fishing you can do. What we've learned, and these are studies out of UC Santa Barbara and based on Channel Islands, where you have a reserve that's over 40 years old, those old reserves are very resistant to climate change, and to invasive species. So when you allow nature to heal, and it takes time, it took time to overfish it, it took time to pollute it, it took time to for, um, climate change to interact, but, but when you give these reserves time to heal themselves, they can be incredibly productive. So I promised you that I was gonna show a video. Let's see if it actually plays, yes. So here's, here's the underwater, like if you took away the water, this is what your islands look like. You know where you are, Santa Barbara. We didn't put you on the map. Um, we partner with uh, NOAA, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, with California Department of Fish and Wildlife to develop the methods for data collection and analysis, and that's our robotic submarine, the Beagle. So we launch it off the ship, we fly it out away, and then we dive it down to, as Jacques would say, to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> and sometimes this is what we see. And this is good. I mean, there's fish there, right? And there's all sorts of fish. There's a, anybody know what that is? A wolf, yeah. yeah. Pretty flamboyant for California fish. Anybody know what that is? Other than our, our Mare team? Flag rockfish. This is my favorite. They're actually kind of purple. The video doesn't quite come out. Anybody know what that is? That was a ratfish. 
This was an aggregation of a type of crab that um, we, I don't think we'd ever seen more than two in a dive, and we saw hundreds, and they were perched on the side of a cliff, kind of doing, I mean, <laughs> we saw them falling and climbing down the cliff, but it was a mating aggregation that didn't know how to. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, corals tonight. The one that has the white on it, that's not a good sign. That's a sign of it um, dying, and it's being co-opted by another animal. There's an example of a very healthy one. Um, we're seeing more and more of the, of the white uh, co-opting. Uh, in fact, we saw some this week. But uh, these are called coral gardens. They're very important as nurseries for young fish, a place to hide um, when, when you're hors d'oeuvre size. This is a, a black coral. We just collected a couple of these um, this week for the Monterey Bay Aquarium, who are creating a new exhibit in 2021 to showcase the deep sea and especially deep sea corals, which um, we don't know a lot about yet. And the beauty of some of these sponges, I mean, these are down, I think if I, I can't quite read it, but I think they're down around 400 meters. It's the, on the left side down near the bottom, there should be a big number. Okay. This is a coral found around the world, and it was predicted that it would not be here because we have highly acidic waters, and it's not man-made, it's just old water. It hasn't had uh, seen oxygen for a long time. So this coral called Lophelia managed to persist here um, despite what scientists predicted, and we've been finding it out uh, between Anacapa and uh, Santa Cruz Island and a few other places uh, just recently the, over the last couple of weeks. This is one of the bigger patches that we've seen. In the Gulf of Mexico, these patches are gigantic, but it is here and it's um, actually quite beautiful when you look up close. And then I love, love seeing reefs like this with lots of different animals, lots of um, coverage of the habitat, big rocky features, and this is what you have out there. Some of it is accessible from snorkeling, some of it deeper. Um, does anybody know what that is? Torpedo rays. So this is an electric eel, basically. It can shock its prey with about 20,000 volts. So it doesn't have any predators, as you can imagine. <laughs> I've been advised by our, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I had to ask our electrical engineer, so can I get the ROV close to that or are we in danger? He said, no, we're ground, we're ground fault protected. We're, you're, you're gonna be fine. So now we go closer. That's one of the uh, threatened fish there, the, the one that was hiding. I, it has a, a behavior very much like an ostrich. You come up to them, they usually try to hide in a hole with their head and their whole tail and everything is sticking out. Very, very amusing to me as an engineer that the species all act the same, but they can be completely different ways of acting than a fish that looks very similar, but of different species. Uh, this lost equipment is not ours for the record. We just documented it. And then we offered to go get it, uh, and it is now removed. So this is uh, no longer in kind of the devil's triangle of, um, of uh, let's see, where was that? Steve, where's Steve? Was that? Okay, so that's in between Anacapa and Santa Cruz Island. Thanks, Steve. Another uh, black corals, these things live hundreds of years. And so if you're a coral and you're rooted to the ground, you have, uh, you have to change with the times. You can't swim somewhere else. This happens to be a place off Anacapa that was my favorite dive site of all the places we, we experienced in the Channel Islands. And it's because I love the color purple. And uh, we, we, ran, we had a hiatus between 19, uh, 2009 and 2014. These were like scotch broom all over this particular dive site full of giant black sea bass that you'll see in a moment. When we came back in 2014, they were all gone. Completely disappeared, it was heartbreaking. Um, again, happened in my short lifetime. And uh, this is where we would find, now the giant black sea bass, oddly enough, are still coming back to this place. And this is one of them. And these guys are big, and they're protected because they're kind of like puppy dogs. They will often swim right up to us, which is not a good thing if somebody has a spear gun. And you're probably wondering, why is it shimmering down on the bottom of the screen, right? Water was leaking into our camera. 
this giant black sea bass was at a cleaning station, and it's the big dilemma. Do we pull the equipment up and fix the leak, or do we just white knuckle it and get this incredible footage? So we, we, uh, we lucked out. We got the footage. We then moved the ROV into the cleaning station. Black sea bass swam off, and we didn't flood the camera. So you all know what that is, right? Octopus, good. So what I love about this is octopi have um, different modes of transportation. We have never been inked by an octopus, even though this is pretty deep. I forget how deep, a couple hundred meters probably. Um, so it's pitch dark. We come in with these blazing lights, and then the octopus says, OK, I'm going to show you walking or slinking away. So this is one mode of transportation. Can you imagine coordinating eight different arms? <laughs> so if you're fascinated by that, read Soul of the Octopus, which I just read, um, which explains a lot about octopus analogy or uh, anatomy. And there's swimming. But they only, the giant Pacific octopus, and that was filmed here in the Channel Islands, um, they only live a couple of years, and they're incredibly smart. You get that? We already knew that, but reading the book, I knew it even better. If they lived to our age, we would be subservient to them. <laughs> okay, so now you're saying, okay, Dirk, you're, you're um, saying you're doing science, but what are you really doing out here? Are you just playing in, in the Channel Islands? No. Um, together with the Department of Fish and Game, in fact, they really led this effort. Um, we developed methods to go and assess uh, the, the marine reserves. And these are your marine, marine reserves um, around the Channel Islands, okay? Um, and that means either no fishing or limited fishing. And so we selected a bunch of sites, uh, starting, well, I guess, it took us a lot of sites to find 10 good ones, and that's five site pairs. So pairs of sites where we have a reserve site that we wanted to compare with a fished site and see how they, how they evolve over time. Is there a change? Are reserves working? That was our big question, 2003. So we pick, I'm going to take you through these four sites because it's, um, Anacamp is a little complicated. And, um, but anyway, that's what, what I'm going to take you now, a little deeper dive into science. Don't be afraid, it's, it, you'll get it. It's been a long time since grammar school. I'm not gonna look at Anna Kappa. That'll be, um, if I ever get invited back, we'll talk about Anna Kappa. So, um, this is what the seafloor looks like, and we're gonna do a transect. In other words, we're gonna plan. We don't lay ropes on the bottom or anything. We plan a line in, in the world, and then we fly along it. And with the ROV Beagle, we have a visual swath that we're um, collecting video data, real time, of all the animals along the seafloor. And then we have uh, our laboratory up in Eureka, California, where we, we have trained biologists that go through every inch of video eight times and determine what is there. And there's different layers. So we start with the habitat layer. That's a simple one. So this young gentleman over here, this is where we would start you. Is it mud, sand, rock, or boulder, okay? So that's where everybody starts. If they can tolerate that for a year, then they move up to uh, either fish or invertebrates, to, uh, depending on what they're interested in. Invertebrate means they don't have a backbone. So abalone, lobster, squid, those are invertebrates. Like those guys, sea stars, anemones, and so forth. So we went out to one of our sites, and these are the lines and we, uh, that we flew. And it, um, the, the first layer we lay down in our, in our results are the habitat type. And so these are the habitats. If it's dark, it means it's rocky, like it's a hard reef. If it's white, that means it's sand. So where do the rock fish go? Do they go to the sand? No, okay. So the, the rock fish all end up in the rocks or right near the rocks. And you say, well, how did you create that map? And this is how we created it, is if we zoom in on that square, and the different colored uh, uh, squares are uh, different species of fish, um, this is what that video looked like that created or resulted in this map. So lots of different types of fish over that rocky habitat. There's even some, uh, 
some of the corals have disappeared off Manacapa Island in there. So that's how we get to our results. And then we quantify, like, how many of them are there, how many different species, is it a hot spot, is it a breeding aggregation area? We had a breeding, we ran into a breeding aggregation area right off UC Santa Barbara, off Campus Point. And we had the director of uh, Fish and Game on the, on the boat that day. He came out on his paddleboard on a, on a weekend day, left his family to come be with us. So, um, of those, remember, site pairs, uh, fished area, reserve site, Looking at these five fish that were most abundant in your Channel Islands, um, this is what we saw. So um, basically between uh, 2004 and 2015, we saw a huge increase. We knew they would increase inside the reserves. The question was outside. Well, outside went up 270%. So that more than makes up for the area lost to fishing. It's a very positive state. We haven't been back to the sites yet, uh, but we are going back to a few of them this summer in July. And so don't be intimidated by the graph other than look at, you know, average the blue lines, which are uh, bef before the reserves really took off and the outlying areas where the fish wandered, like it's too crowded in the reserve, I'm going to go over in the fished area. The red, the red bars are um, what happened in 2014-2015. In, uh, uh, scuba divers saw the exact same thing, so everything matches. And this is an, another way of demonstrating that. So this is one of our favorite places off of uh, Santa Cruz Island. Uh, there's our wiggly lines of ROV transect. Those, those transects or those lines are half a kilometer wide, so they're roughly a quarter mile long. And so that's what it looked like in uh, 2000, let me help me, uh, 2004 and 2014? Okay. So we zoom in on that little square. It makes it a lot easier. There's a couple fish there. Not, and notice there's not very many lingcod, the blue one, which is um, a, a predator fish, an ambush, sit on the bottom, you swim by me, I eat you sort of fish. But you can see a huge difference graphically in this slide, right? We can all tell. And what's really hard to portray in a representation like this is they were stacked up like pizzas. That's a bad analogy, but, but I think there are something like 27 rockfish in this photograph. And we only have one little piece of real estate to put the little square. Um, and it's a couple of different species. So this is what happens. So first thing to note on this is that the red is a state marine reserve. And there's typically more fish in the reserve to start in 2005, right? The, the red bar is taller than the blue bar, but they both go up. That's the important thing of this graph. All of those five that were most abundant went up. And you could argue uh, convincingly that for something like lingcod, which was very depressed, fish and wildlife were thinking of taking it off the, or making the size limit bigger or forbidding uh, fishing of them all together. Uh, the blue line, which was the fished areas, was teeny, and that increase in lingcod was phenomenal. So it's a, it's a great sign of what a fast-growing fish can do if there's some protection. And then it translated outside into the fishable area. And then the same thing happened with uh, the other fish that, of the five, okay? so. In my opinion, having been out here for 15 years, this works. Marine reserves work. What else are we seeing? So that's a positive sign, right? We can all agree on that. When it comes to our work, since it's video, we record it all and it's archived. So we can go back and look at things. How were they before? We used to find this giant sunflower star on every single dive. We haven't seen one in about four years. We're not sure they're coming back. But we could go back into our old data, and we saw zero in a whole bunch of transects uh, over a couple of years, 130. So that's about 140 kilometers worth, about 100 miles worth of survey on the seafloor didn't see a single one, not a single one. Prior to that, we saw in just 29 transects, so that's 15 kilometers, that's, I don't know, eight miles, we saw 242. Now this is, you may, you may say, oh, sea stars, you know, big deal. 
They are, they are the enforcer on the seafloor. They manage, they keep everybody in check. They keep um, the urchins in check. And if, if nobody keeps the urchins in check, they gobble up the kelp beds, the kelp forests, and then we have a whole cascade of events. We lose abalone, we lose other fish. So this is an ongoing problem, and it was um, a, a virus that zippered from San Diego up to the Puget Sound um, over a couple of years. Now, the divers saw it first, and we were not seeing it in the deep water, and we thought for a while that maybe the deep water was a refugia for these, um, these sunflower stars. Unfortunately, a year later, they were all gone. So it, it was not. Um, we hope to see some in the future. You know, there's got to be a few that survived, and then we may need to intervene and grow them out in uh, facilities and, and replant them. This was dive number 42. Um, this was two years ago. As soon as we hit the bottom, very deep, this is what happened. And we just saw one of these the uh, day before yesterday. Big six-gill shark. Doesn't seem at all upset by our presence. So that's a thousand feet deep. It's, it's certainly the first time he's seen one of us. But talk about graceful swimmers. I mean, just magnificent animals, incredibly well evolved. More coral gardens. And this is all right out there. I mean, this is your backyard. You have more marine mammals come through here than just about any place on the planet. This is incredibly fecund, rich uh, waters, and we need to protect it, is, is basically the takeaway. But for me, it's, it's the beauty, it's the diversity, it's um, the animals I'm learning on a daily basis, being, you know, working with marine biologists. You know, do we know where the squid go for three months of the year, the market squid, the calamari that we eat? Um, no, we don't. So it's, it's fundamental knowledge that we, we, need to, we need to acquire if we want to uh, manage these resources um, intelligently. This was a, uh, a new species that we, uh, we had to pluck uh, three of them off the seafloor. And it, it was a little upsetting because normally when we gather uh, deep sea corals, they, they preserve them, they put them in cold sea water and they take them back to the lab and they clone them and they grow them out. And because it was a new species, they, they take it out of our, um, our collection box and they dump it in formaldehyde. It was the first time we'd ever seen them kill one for science so that they could key it out and, and make sure, in fact, it was a new species. And then recently, we were part of a discovery of, of a second species up in um, off San Francisco Bay this past summer. And um, it's because we're able to go down, collect samples, bring them back for genetic testing so that they can determine the difference. And then usually where we see these deep sea corals, uh, you'll see a lot of fish too, that they're highly associated. So it, it adds something um, to the habitat. So these are your typical rock fish here. And all of our best footage comes from Channel Islands. When we go up north to like Eureka, Crescent City, you can see about three feet uh, we run into a lot of rocks up there. Actually, one time at the Farallon Islands, the krill were so thick, we ran in, I ran into a 30-foot uh, high wall. So look at the bottom of that purple gorgonian, or deep sea coral, there's a giant lincoln. And who wouldn't want a sculpture like that in their house? Goblet, goblet sponge. And then, you know, there's gotta be king of the hill, right? Crabs sitting on top. When they die, and uh, you know, we're, we haven't been going deep for a long time, probably about five or six years, but we're starting to see dead ones. In the beginning, we didn't see any. So that's too soon to say if, um, as somebody mentioned, I think it was you, that um, the warmth is being absorbed into the ocean and going deeper. Um, we think it is, but it just hasn't been enough time for us to tell if, um, if this is abnormally high sponge um, death. And, and coral death. But so let's talk a little bit about um, deep sea corals. Um, more than two thirds are not tropical. They're not the type you think about on the Great Barrier Reef. They're the type you have right out, out here at the Channel Islands, and they're all over the world. And uh, they're always associated with fish and 
uh, crab and invertebrate populations. We usually see little critters hiding all over the place and we take a sample. Uh, the next morning there's all sorts of things we didn't see in the tanks that were hitchhiking, but they were obviously, obviously living there. And the primary threat to these deep sea corals is what we call bottom trawling. That's where you drag a big net across the seafloor. And so to put things in perspective, uh, the eldest or the longest lived species that we know of is a glass sponge. And we've, we've sampled some that are over 11,000 years old. I mean, if we make it to 100, we're doing pretty good, right? The oldest, um, the oldest whale is 200 years. Uh, oldest rockfish is 200 years. Um, brittle cone pine up in the Sierras, what is that? 5,000, I can't read without my glasses, but you get the idea. The, but the, what stuns me about these animals, the, the long-lived, uh, you know, black coral, brittle, brittle cone, and um, glass sponge, they can't move, so they have to adapt to their changing environment. They have to heal themselves uh, from any plight, any virus, any tumor, and that's why um, medical science is very interested in these animals. We can't just wantonly destroy them to get at the fish. And then some fish use them to accessorize. Like, do you see the fish in the background there? Matching its stripes kind of with a similarly colored coral. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of sense of humor down in, in the deep sea. So, medical uses. And some of these uh, have gone through trials and are in, in common use today. Um, antibiotics, cancer, um, some treatments for breast cancer, growing new bone or dental implants and anti-inflammatory. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. It often takes 20 years to get anything FDA approved and all the way into um, the doctor's arsenal, but this is why these sponges need to be left intact. And, and I'm proud to say that with a team of others, including young people of um, a little older than you, we were able to protect almost a huge, well, most of California from bottom trawling uh, where, we, where we have discovered any of these sponges. So it was a very precautionary approach taken by the, the managing council that manages all of West Coast fisheries, and that just happened last April. And we were um, very excited because we don't want that destruction to happen. This is an example of um, one of those corals from Channel Islands uh, with the researchers. Um, and this was off of, uh, looks like uh, Anna Kappa, if I'm reading my map right. And that went back to the lab and it, it was cloned. Basically, you can snip off little pieces, you can grow all sorts of baby ones out of the, out of the parent. And it turns out that if you want to replant it, you epoxy it to a rock and you throw it overboard. It has to be a heavy rock because these can grow big and you don't want them to blow over in the current. But that's, that's a way that we could replant in some of the places and that's what they're doing right now in the Gulf of Mexico where we had the big, um, BP oil disaster. So the reason the fines were so big, this is your national trust. This is, uh, these are common, you know, it's like the tragedy of the commons. There was, um, the corals died, uh, pretty much all of them died within, a, and I think it was about a half a kilometer of the BP spill. And then as you went out in concentric circles, there was less and less death, but there was still stress, some death, but they were able to quantify it because they had a baseline before. These corals were coexisting with offshore oil and gas drilling just fine 10 years before, five years before, one year before, boom, gone. So you could really point the finger at this oil spill, which we want to prevent from happening. And as we all know, or at least those of you who are here in 69, um, it happened right here in Santa Barbara in Paradise. Oh, you were here. Yeah. So um, part of our work has evolved into finding these deep sea coral uh, gardens and aggregations and helping protect them before they're destroyed. Um, it can take a long time to get it back. And so this is what not to do. And look how big this one is. Um, I don't know, I don't have any idea how old that is, but it's gotta be old. And it was just kind of getting in the way of, of fisheries. Fishing or, fishermen are doing their job, they're just trying to catch fish. We didn't know how important they were to the ecosystem at that time. It turns out um, we're still learning. Another, and this is more of a, um, perhaps a man-made event, 
I don't know if anybody remembers 2015, we had this huge mass of warm water off California and called it the, this is the science term, this cracks me up, the warm water blob. That, that's its technical term, warm water blob. And uh, we, we saw temperatures of 70 degrees Fahrenheit at 100 feet deep. Uh, normally it'd be about 62, 63 degrees. And it was uh, actually a second grader. And I said, you know, it doesn't seem like it's that big a temperature difference. And the kid said, um, yeah, but if you, had a temp if you had a fever for a month and a half, wouldn't you die? And I said, oh yeah, I think I would. Especially that big a, a gradient. And this is an animal that, you know, it has small variations through the year, but nothing like that and nothing that persists that hot for that long. And so this is also what you read about with tropical coral reefs that they, um, they just can't handle the high, the prolonged high temperatures. And uh, so the way we documented this is we placed uh, these temperature loggers down uh, at various depths and we happened to catch the part of that uh, warm water blob and, and, uh, and see what, what temperatures were hitting those animals. And then we have the same temperature probes on the ROV but we're only down for, you know, at a day at a time, whereas these loggers, we can leave them down for, in the, in the early days, for a year. Now we can leave them down for 10 years. In fact, we put some out this week that uh, they can last 10 years and log the, log the temperature over that time period. So we'll get more data out, out here in the, what I call the R&D center, the Channel Islands. And this is what happened. Remember, I talked about my favorite place. So that coral on the far left, that was one of my favorites, and they grow really big. They're like scotch broom, if you know what that is. That's a healthy one on the left. You see the white on there, it's a zoanthid. It's a type of, um, well, it's gonna take over that whole coral. Then the to second from the right, that looks like a healthy coral. It's not, it's dead, it's gone. And then when that zoanthid leaves, that's what you get is the stump. You have one fish run into it, and that stump's gone. You never knew there were corals there at all. And we did not see that these corals were disappearing or even under stress until they were gone. And that was the value of being able to go back into our video and look at it. And this was a high school project that went to the state finals. One of our uh, biologist sons needed a high school project. And Andy said to him, well, why don't you look at these corals? They used to be there, now they're gone. We, and so he looked at some of our uh, video through that area and he compared three years we told them what to look for. And then it turns out if it's red, that means they're stressed or, you guys can read better than me, stressed or dying. And um, yellow is that they're under just stress and they may die or they may survive. Um, so there was stress going on as early as 2005. But um, in 2014, when we went back, it was, um, in my mind, at least that one dive site, which is, Anacapa is a warm island anyway, but just catastrophic. So that was the value of you know, recording that stuff. Uh, this is a very short time frame, geologically speaking, 10 years, right? So um, I promised I, I would show you a little bit of fresh footage. Uh, this was from the 14th, uh, excuse me, the 8th, 06, 08. So that was last week. And this, these were the, <laughs> the corals that disappeared on Anacapa. See, I told you I like purple. But they're big, and uh, I don't exactly know how, how old they are, but they're very hardy. We um, collected a few for the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and in a couple of years, hopefully, you'll be able to go over and, and see them and examine them up close. Uh, black coral as well, these do live a long time. Um, the scientist on board last week estimated that this one um, was well over 100 years old. And look who's living there. We're not exactly sure, but we think those are baby Boccaccio. Boccaccio um, are become a very big rockfish, and it's um, actually one of the, the ones that re has rebounded and sustainable, but you gotta hide when you're the hors d'oeuvre, right? This was last week's, or actually this week's shark. This one was a little more elusive. Um, we could not get in front of it, it, uh, we kept trying to head it off at the pass, and then we would turn around and wait for it and see that it had gone the other way. So this was one of the smarter six-gill sharks that, that we've seen. But, you know, he wasn't fleeing per se, but he didn't want us to get, or she, to get too close. All right. 
Lincoln. This was uh, those, uh, they were kind of like hunting like wolves. There was three and ultimately four of them and we kind of uh, were in right along our transect and we followed for a while. And all around them were um, other rockfish, but just great seeing those pockets of, um, of richness. And then this was one of the highlights for me of, of the last two weeks, this um, kind of purpley brown coral I had never seen before. And so we peeked over the top as we were running the line and there were fish everywhere. So why are they there? We don't know. Why is that coral so rare in the Channel Islands? We don't know. But right around that area, we found a few more. And I, um, maybe some of our crew had seen them before. I never had. So we call this the honey hole. And it's fishable. So you could torture me, but I'm not going to tell you where it is. Because <laughs> we know. So we slowed down. We didn't want to frighten anybody. Um, it was just too good to look at. And that, um, that gives us hope for, you know, replenishing. Because the bigger the rockfish, it turns out, this is an important term. It will be a quiz on this after um, the lecture. Both, big old fertile female. So when a fish get exponentially better at breeding with age, unlike us, we're kind of flatliners and we taper off to nothing. Uh, these boffs, these big old fertile females, they can have, um, uh, say, when they reach sexual maturity, one of the examples is a vermilion rockfish, which you have off, off your shores. They have 150,000 um, live young per year. And a big boff, can have well over 1.5 million. More yolk um, in, in the, the stage of development when it's an egg, so better chance of survival. Plus, they breed multiple times a year, so you really want boffs in your, um, in your reserves, replenishing surrounding waters. Now, I had talked earlier about bottom trawling, so what, it, what, what the hell is bottom trawling? So it's where you drag um, these orange things are the doors. These are big, heavy-weighted doors that keep the net open and then the big net rolls along the bottom, usually in a semi-rocky area, is, that's where damage is done. In the sand, we're not seeing a lot of damage. That's a good place to use this, but not in the rocky reef. So um, there goes a sponge. Boom, gone. That, that won't be back. And it, it, it'll leave a lot of a rubble in its place. So if you go to the restaurant, you uh, order fish, and it's a rockfish, and it's somehow trawled, which, which happened when I was a kid, um, Choose not to eat it. Ask for one that's caught another way. Or go to a flatfish like a sand dab or sole or something else and um, choose that. But don't, I would say don't encourage um, the bottom trawling of, of fish, not just here, we import a lot of fish, but in other nations as well. And then we also came across this giant net. This is in a marine reserve. Uh, we don't know how long it's been there. This is the first time we've ever encountered it but um, it has been there a while. But look at the size of this thing. Luckily, we didn't get caught in it. And trouble with nets like this is they'll keep fishing for a while. You know, there'll be some um, uh, dead fish in there or eventually then other fish will come in to eat them and crabs and other things get caught. And so it, it continues fishing for a while. This was shallow enough, it actually could be removed by divers. So we're contemplating not that we're gonna go do that, but there are groups uh, that will remove uh, derelict, what we call derelict or lost fishing gear. And uh, I, I, these are quite expensive too. I'm sure the fisherman did not want to lose his net down there, but probably um, it was a good fishing area. So hopefully we can help you know, prevent that from happening in the future. Okay, so what is Mari doing? Uh, upcoming, we're finishing up our expedition down here over the next two days. Uh, then we're, if you're up in Richmond, California, in the Bay Area, you can come to our open house on the 29th of June. You can fly our ROV around in San Francisco Bay. It's great for kids. Um, if the Warriors are playing tonight, by the way, we also have a little exhibit where uh, we take our manipulator arm and you get to try to, uh, to make a basket. Um, and uh, the, it seems like um, boys and girls from about 8 to 12 spend all of their time there. Then uh, we're continuing our, our marine protected area assessments uh, in July back down here. So we'll be here from the 11th to the, um, 
by 11th of July to late July, and then we move up to Central California, so out of the Monterey area um, in August. And then uh, we get to do the last of the West Coast sanctuaries. This is, we've done four of them that are in California. I mean, your sanctuaries are also a gift. I mean, these are, there's a lot of protection right here in the Channel Island Sanctuary. Very thankful we have it here. And that you have a great staff. They're now co-located with UC Santa Barbara, coordinating uh, research going on there for many years. But we've never been to the uh, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, and so we're excited to go there. It'll be interesting because there's no maps. So usually we try to go where there's maps so we can pick types of habitat that we want to go look at. Um, this will be just kind of like Darwin, just going blind. And then an exciting new project, and it's based, again, I want to bring this back to Santa Barbara. We developed, Mari was able to develop with Department of Fish and Wildlife and NOAA, the, the tools to collect the deep water data and to analyze it. And we're now exporting that to Hawaii. So Hawaii has an even bolder initiative. They want 30% marine managed areas is what they call them there by 2030. The governor was just re-elected on that part of, that was part of his platform. They, um, but they have no baseline to speak of below 45 feet, but the law states that it must go to 150. So we're gonna go out there, take our methods developed here, first in Channel Islands and then the rest of the state, and help them do that, teach them how to do that, and then go another place and and um, we hope to be kind of a Johnny Appleseed in empowering them to manage their own ocean better. And so, in closing, and we'll have Q&A afterwards, but, you know, stay ocean engaged. The reason you're here tonight is you care about marine heritage, you care about the ocean, but we'd like you to spread the word. Um, this, is our, this is our life support system. It's our heart and lungs. And if these oceans are suffering, ultimately we are going to too. And so you're probably now just saying, Dirk, what can I do? So what can we do? Well, first of all, you're supporting the Maritime Museum, which is a great thing. My personal choice for here is I'd love to help you guys create a great Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary exhibit talking about the epicenter of this bold conservation initiative, the success in the MPAs that are right out there. This story fits in perfectly with the commercial uh, and shipping applications, and it's a jewel, and it's a great story to be told right here to, to people that come in because they're curious. You know, we've got Chumash Indians and tar seeps and oil and gas. There's also something extraordinary going on with our marine life, and it's called recovery. And then consider investing uh, with us in the Aloha Challenge, which is gonna start in, in February over in Hawaii. We're uh, two-thirds the way uh, to raising the money needed to go over there, and we want to help the Hawaiians uh, do the right thing. And then, when it, if it comes time to vote on something that you can think it has an, you know, an application to the, to the ocean, vote for your ocean. You know, we, we, don't have any, um, we don't have any fish in Congress at this point, <laughs> or the Senate. Okay, so with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. In the back there. So the oil rigs that are currently off the coast, are they operational or not? I mean, I've heard that they're not, that they can't be removed <coughs> because they would disrupt the, the, the marine environment. So I, I believe the question was are the offshore oil rigs that we see out there, are they operational or not? And I haven't been living down here for a long time, but I believe some of them are. And I'm sure some of you seven, have. The seven of them are closed that, that are. <laughs> We're using the pipeline that broke, the refugio pipeline that broke. So seven of them are not um, are producing operational right now. Holly, right off UCSB, Cold Point, has been decommissioned. The discussion is what to do with that platform. Uh, there are four to five tons of marine life on them. We are actually going to be uh, hosting an expo on November 20th on what alternative uses, potential alternative uses of oil platforms. Uh, whether to get rid of them or to turn them into some marine protected areas themselves or things like that. So November 20th, look for that. That, that's a, that is going to be a great, I might come back down for that. 
<clears throat> I'm curious, there's so many whales we have in the channel, and I suppose in the, the Belize they're feeding on krill. Do you have any idea how all this occurs and why all these whales are here? So the question is, why do we have so many whales in the Santa Barbara Channel? And I think I will defer to your neighbor here, <laughs> Hiroko. I am not a whale expert. Just the food. The food. And it's krill, and they also eat squid and small forage fish, correct? Yeah. Okay. Anchovies, sardines. Anchovies, sardines. So they're, um, yeah, they're here for the food. Again, this is a very nutrient-rich area. Yes, sir. Uh, that they are, many of them we're seeing now, we're not seeing for many, many years. My father, for example, was on the sea here for 50 years and I never saw a blue whale because they were uh, completely, you know, almost extinct. Now they're coming back because of the health. So the, the comment was, there are some whales that are coming back for the first time. His father had fished for 50 years, never saw a blue whale out there. And now we're seeing, we saw, I think, three last year. Okay, I got this side. I need to go back over this side. Any questions? Yes, Marie. On the deep sea coral, is the harvesting for scientific purposes, is that having any effect on the population, the size of the deep sea coral? Are, are, are the, is the harvesting we're doing of deep sea corals having an effect on the overall population? Uh, no. Scientific or medical? Scientific or medical. Um, medical is still emerging, but we're finding lots of them. Again, and the one thing I didn't mention in this presentation, the ocean's only about 5%, I don't know I did say it, about 5% about explored. So, there's going to be a lot more of them in other places we just haven't been to yet, and there's more discoveries to come, but we, at least uh, the way we work, is we don't take a single coral all by itself that we've never seen before. We would leave that there. But we'll take some where we're finding other ones around it. And sometimes we'll take the smaller one. For example, uh, for the Monterey Bay Aquarium, <clears throat> they wanted uh, it was a black, they wanted a black coral, one of these ones that lived several hundred years. And uh, the big one we saw was too big for us to get inside our box. So, and it was too big for the cooler that they were going to drive it home in. So we got the small one and left the big one right next to it. But um, we don't take that many. This um, expedition, I bet we took about uh, 15. Uh, last year, we had a 30-day marathon expedition, and we took about 100, but that was between Washington State and San Diego. And so, I have no idea how many there are out there, but I would guess millions. So I think it's, it's a drop in the bucket, but something we should pay attention to if we started mining them. Typically with pharmaceuticals, I think what we'll do is synthesize whatever they have for anti-tumor, inflammatory, cancer, and so we would harvest them initially to learn about them, and then we would synthesize that drug. Yes? Um, talk a little about the distinctions, differences between national marine sanctuaries and these statewide MPAs, the overlap, the, the basis of that. So the question is, what is the difference between a national marine sanctuary, and we have 13, I believe, in the United States, and, pardon, 14, you count the Northwest Hawaiian Islands? So, um, and a marine protected area. Great question. And a little tough, and, I, and I'll get it mostly right, so pardon me, because I, I, do we have anybody from the sanctuary here by a chance? The what? Oh, you're from the sanctuary? Uh, Naturalist from the marine sanctuary, yes. Oh, can you, you might be able to get the answer better than me then on this one. What is that? Well, the question is, what is the difference? I can talk about MPAs pretty knowledgeably, um, and I, well, I'll tell you what, I'll start, and then you add in, if you would, sir, what I miss. So with marine protected areas, if it's a pure reserve, you cannot take anything. So you leave everything where it is. You can go and look, you can scuba dive in there, you can uh, snorkel, you can kayak over the top, uh, but you cannot take any living creature without an exceptionally difficult to get permit, right? So on our expedition the last two weeks, we didn't take anything out of the marine protected areas. They wanted to, but they were not given permission, okay? Um, if it's a marine conservation area, like you have on the west side of Anacapa, I believe the only thing you can take is lobster. 
but you can't take anything else. You can't take anything else. So they're very, very restrictive. That's, I think, the key. And the idea being that you allow nature to heal itself. Marine sanctuaries tend to be much, much bigger in size. I know you cannot dump nuclear waste there. I mean, we laugh, but we dump it other places. You cannot dump um, a raw sewage from a boat, or you can't have a sewage outfall in one. You, let's see, help me now. You, I don't think you can bottom trawl. No. Well, you have, you have MPAs for California, and you have MPAs for the federal in the sanctuary. Okay? The, sanctu uh, the marine sanctuaries, the national marine sanctuaries, are like a national park in the ocean. Okay? And so you have some areas which are restricted. Out here we have about 20% in, in the uh, Channel Island Marine Sanctuary, uh, segregated, segregated off as marine, uh, as marine protected areas. And the restrictions you're, you're outlining apply there. Okay, and if the propagation from uh, uh, the animals in there is the same there as what, you, what you've been saying and you know, finding in, in your research. Okay, yeah, so uh, sanctuary, so we have 80% of the sanctuary where you can't fish and 20% where you cannot. But, you know, okay, but it's a place where you can go and explore. And then we have the National Park, which is right there too. So we have, it's the only place where we have National Park seen right on top of the Marine Sanctuary. And, and it, the two organizations work together very, very well. And the park actually has, a, has one mile coming out uh, as, as part of its thing, and the sanctuary comes out six miles for our, our sanctuary that we have here. Okay, and so uh, it, it, it's really quite, quite good. But a sanctuary is like a, a, a national park in the water. That's a really good explanation, and they're federal. So remember, California's jurisdiction goes out as far as you could fire a cannonball in, I don't know, 1875, three miles. Is that in the museum? Did I learn that here? <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's why it's three miles in a, for state waters, which the state of California controls. Beyond that is the feds, out to 200 nautical miles, which is quite a ways offshore. I saw a question back in the middle here, yes. You mentioned that Anacapa Island is warm. What does that mean, and why is it warm? So I, I said Anacapa is warm, and why is it warm? One of the other great things, and I'm so glad you asked this question, about the Channel Islands is that um, it, they're directly below Point Conception. So the inner two islands, Anacapa being the most inner, closest to Ventura Oxnard, 11 miles, and Santa Cruz have tr uh, more Southern California temperatures and animals. That's what you find down in San Diego, Los Angeles. The outer two islands, Santa Rosa, San Miguel, that's where the cold water is coming down from the north. So it's, those are Northern California animals right there. So you have this incredible mixing, um, which again, creates the food. Anacapa is the first to receive, some, sometimes the current flows the opposite way, so it comes up from Mexico even. So the water is warmer there. It's also closer uh, inland, not as rough, not as mixed um, as, as it is on the outer islands, and I think that's why it's the warmest. Um, and then they get progressively colder as you go out, like uh, San Miguel was pretty darn cold last week. The water was. The, weather was fantastic. Oh, sorry. Uh, so you've seen similar results in the invertebrates and how would that one is doing? Good question. Are we, are we seeing some of the results uh, from the invertebrates such as abalone? We uh, started being very fish focused and we have the archival data, and, but we have not gone back and looked at, uh, at all the invertebrates. And one thing about abalone, the tough part about abalone, other than white abalone, is they're very cryptic. They like to be up under rocks. Uh, so we don't see them. So even if we were looking for recovery of abalone, we would not be the ones to, to tell you that. It would be divers. The white abalone, though, we can find. So we had a project in 2004 with Department of Fish and Wildlife. They, uh, they're deep. These abalone were um, prized because they were uh, the, the tastiest of the abalone family. 
And they live typically at 100 feet deep, and they're out in the open. They're at the base of a rock, kind of rock sand interface. So they're easy to see because they're out in the open. And they were, they're going, they were the first um, mollusk on the endangered species list. They will go extinct. Uh, they're just, they, they're not in close enough proximity to find a mate, pure and simple. So we're doing everything we can to uh, help that population recover, but I don't think it's going to happen. The, the, uh, the experiment that was done is the department sent two divers uh, down to collect some, and they found two, and they brought them up. We did a bunch of uh, surveys off Santa Cruz Island, and we found two with the ROV. And then the divers, instead of uh, absorbing all that nitrogen at depth, scouting around for them at 100 feet. They just went down our umbilical, grabbed the two, and they went to um, a grow-out facility that is now up in Bodega Bay. <clears throat> they have a wonderful dilemma. They have close to 10,000 white abalone from a couple of parents there, and they're trying to figure out how to place them. So these abalone grew up in pretty sterile conditions of filtered seawater, um, and how do you put it out into a natural environment where there's pathogens and viruses and things? So that's the dilemma Bodega Bay is working on right now before they try to outplant um, some of those some of those white abalone. But um, we could I'm sure you could get an abalone speaker in here who's far more knowledgeable than me. Sea Center is okay. interesting. So their natural habitat was, um, all, yeah, pretty, pretty much Southern California below, all right. the way to Mexico. You know, what's interesting is it, Catalina was the epicenter when they, when they were harvested in big numbers, way back when. So anyway, thank you. Yes, sir. There's several organizations internationally, even those came like Greenpeace and Bushing Conservancy, sort of fried here in Channel Island. Yeah, so the question is, there's a lot of uh, other ocean conservation uh, agencies. There's uh, Ocean Conservancy, which uh, you have an office here, Greenpeace, and, and others. And we take a lot of pride in, in cooperating with, because, it, I mean, it's, it's game on right now. And we're fairly small and agile. We don't have our own ship, for example, so we collaborate with Department of Fish and Wildlife and NOAA to use their ships. Um, or ships of opportunity so we can get out there and do the work. They, in turn, rely on us to go down and look. Um, Oceana, for example, was instrumental in the closure to bottom trawling when we forbid, well, we found all those deep sea corals and they got, they helped get that word out um, to the, the managing commission. But for sure, the video of these incredible, you know, corals uh, helped that case. So we, we collaborate often with uh, whoever is willing. Um, we're just too small to, to make a difference without doing that. And we have our own expertise that can add, because very few organizations, in fact, none that I know of, work in our area on, this, on, on just the shell. So there's a lot of advocacy going on. We don't do much. We're trying to get the data that, to inform the advocacy and the laws and the, and the proper management. But yeah, we, we need us all. Yes. Yes, um, we, we have a lot of talk about uh, whales, you know, now dying, but uh, this question deals with something. In terms of the whales, when they do die and they go to the bottom of the ocean, we hear that now that uh, maybe nine out of ten die might end up on the bottom of the ocean. I hear that there's an entire new ecosystem and importance of the, the these dead animals on the sea bottom. Are you involved in any of that? research in terms of the part, is that a possibility and how regeneration occurs at the bottom? So, so the question was, um, we've heard about when whales die, and this is what I understand too, is that nine out of 10 of them don't wash up on shore. So we've had a lot of whales washing up on shore this year, but that's only 10%. So do, are we involved in um, doing research with the dead ones or finding the dead ones out in the open ocean? 
And um, the answer to that is we've never seen one. So we don't pursue them, but the ocean is really big. And um, even with the thousands of kilometers of seafloor that we've done, we've never seen a dead, a dead um, whale. We have seen a dead sea lion. And we saw all the animals that were feasting there, including some that have been on everybody's plate. <laughs> kind of uh, makes you think twice. Um, but yeah, there is an ecosystem that evolves around a fallen whale. Uh, and I forget the name of it. Steve, you may know. It's some sort of worm. And uh, anyway, they're, they're always there when there's a dead whale. So uh, I don't think much is known about their biology yet. But yes, they are their own little traveling ecosystem. Thank you all so much. Thank you.